Hi everybody, welcome to the uh, Eager presentation. <clears throat> Hopefully you're in the right place. So, is there any intro? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Eager. Okay, so um, I'm Colin Schwartz, uh, or Colin, C-O-L-A-N on Drupal.org. This is Christopher Gervais, or Ergon Logic. Uh, we've been doing Eager for a little bit, uh, core maintainers. Um, <clears throat> Christopher's been doing it a lot longer than I have, um, but I've been doing it for a little bit too. Um, as far as what we do, typically we focus on big sort of infrastructure, SaaS, IS, like mass hosting projects. We don't typically do, you know, small Drupal site builds, that kind of thing. So any sort of really big projects, kind of things you work on, that's us. Uh, do you want to quickly run through the history? Or? Sure. Yeah. So um, last year we actually celebrated our 10-year anniversary. Uh, I guess maybe it's two years ago now. Um, Basically, it started as a hosting system for a company called Bright out of uh, Vancouver, at, uh, relatively early in, in the development of, of Drupal. And so it was intended to be a mass hosting uh, platform coupled to Pantheon, but of course, you know, many years before they got, came around. Um, it then, that company kind of dissolved and it, uh, development seed took over from it. Uh, they then exited the Drupal community, Kumbit took up um, the, the banner uh, out of Montreal, and that's where I got involved. Uh, I worked there for a number of years and uh, was mentored by the project lead at the time, uh, Antoine Beaupre. And uh, since then, it's kind of uh, spread out into a team. We've got actually a, a formal co op um, where there's a number of agencies that work largely with Eager that, um, uh, that now maintain uh, the core code. And <coughs> uh, in terms of uh, the community, we've got uh, hundreds of installations, which means several thousand users that are, that are uh, operating on it at any given time. Um, we have no idea how many sites are hosted on them, but in the tens of thousands at the very least. Um, I have uh, direct access to uh, eagers that run something on the vicinity of 2,500 sites um, distributed across multiple servers. Um, and then uh, sort of where we're coming from is largely from sort of a sysadmin open source standpoint. This is where, where we kind of live. We're open source developers. And the whole point is to uh, largely share best practices. So as sysadmins, we each uh, have, you know, our, our things that the way we like to run things. But when it comes to managing Drupal sites, as you'll see, there's some pretty strict best practices that really ensure minimal downtime, um, really just high reliability, things that we, we care about as sysadmins. Um, and so that, the, the best practices we've developed over the years are kind of what's encoded into Eager. Uh, we try to take uh, a tools um, focus, so providing tools and not imposing policy. So everything can be overridden, uh, or l largely overridden. Um, unfortunately, it's not something that you can kind of point and click to override a lot of that. Uh, so there, if you're a developer, you can you can hook into it and do a lot of stuff. So that's kind of where we're coming at from that standpoint. And then, the, as I mentioned earlier, it's a free software stack, right? The whole point is from, uh, from the OS on up all the way through Drupal and whatever you, you add on top of that um, ought to be free. So Apache is a web server, MySQL and so forth. The, the LAMP stack and, uh, is kind of what we, what we target. Cool, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, think of it as an open source presentation, so feel free to interrupt, interject, Start discussions, ask questions. Um, that's welcome, please, if you ever want us to stop. So uh, quickly, organizations that are using it, um, National Democratic Institute, uh, their big U.S. government agency, uh, NASA, everyone knows who NASA is, I think, Civic CRMs, the big open source CRM that a lot of folks know about here. Uh, European Commission uses Agar, so a, couple, a bunch of big names there. <clears throat> We've got um, a bunch of components. Uh, so there's, on the front end, we've got Hostmaster, which is the installation profile, uh, which is basically that's the dashboard uh, way to look at it. Um, hosting is all the modules on the front end that do things. And Elder is the theme, like the Drupal theme for that. Uh, the back end is something we call provision. So that's what does the heavy lifting, and that's a bunch of custom Drush commands, uh, at least in Uh For installation, there's a bunch of ways to install it. Um, probably the simplest way is there's a Debian package we maintain, so sudo apt install agar3, right? That's pretty simple. That's for the you know, defaults, you can change some of that. 
Uh, Docker, there's a way to do it with Docker. John did a bunch of work on that, getting that working. Um, and then there's the manual method. So if you, if you want, you can go through that. That's in the documentation. Uh, all the projects, are, it's divided into several projects. Uh, they're all on Drupal.org, as you can see. That's, yep, yeah, that's uh, one of the project pages. Uh, there's some conceptual things uh, that go into Eager to, that you kind of need to understand if you're using it. Do you want to quickly talk about each one? Or? Sure. So um, this is basically what you need to do to pull together a hosting system for Eager, uh, for Drupal sites, right? So you start with servers. Uh, we don't actually currently provision servers, so it's just registering a server, which essentially means that we have SSH access to it and that there's an Eager server installed. However, the Eager Cloud module on Drupal.org does have tools to launch the software layer, right. packets, and some other things. Uh, yeah, good point. So there are contrib modules to do, yeah. yeah. Contrib modules to do some of this, it's just not in core, but yeah, yeah that right. stuff exists if and you want to play with it. Yeah, and future versions, that's one of the things we do intend to do, but as far as Eager 3 and, and what's, uh, what ships out of the box, it's mostly a matter of pointing out an IP address, um, having an Eager user account on that IP address, uh, or on that server, <clears throat> and then having um, having it sort of pre-configured. So there's actually a, an apt package for um, for remote servers if you want to. The majority of cases that we've seen, um, people have one server that's running the Drupal uh, site of the front end, so the hostmaster site, um, the web server, and a MySQL server all in one. Right, like that's kind of a it's a smaller use case. That's the default. There's all kinds of clustering capabilities and things like that that are with advanced sort of uh, high availability and high performance uh, functionality. So we can get into that a little bit later. But essentially, servers are just a node type. They're just a content type um, that have things like a host name associated with them and, and things like that. Services are the main thing that they provide. So that'll be MySQL, Apache. Uh, we have an HTTPS service that'll generate certificates for you, things of that nature. Um, platforms are uh, Drupal code base, so you run Drush Make or Composer or something like that to build up the, uh, the code base that you're going to run. And then sites are the actual installations. So Eager from its core is kind of a multi-site thing, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but sites represent largely the configuration and state, so the database, uh, the vhost uh, that's pointing at that particular URL, and things like that. And then uh, we've got tasks and queues, so the other sort of high level things. Um, so what we, we have a, a series of sort of cron type queues where it'll run um, on a regular basis and then that will trigger cron on hosted sites or run backups uh, you know, at, in the middle of the night or whatever the, the various queues will do for you. And then there's a sort of priority queue, the main queue is a task queue so that when you're looking at a given site for example and you want to run a backup, you push a button, that task gets added to the queue, picked up by the back end and whatever heavy lifting is required for that is done. So MySQL done, gzipping with the site, and so forth. This is, yeah, this is basically the list of, or the view, it's actually a view of the sites. So as you can see, we've got you know, a few sites here. It's got some metadata, and on the right, you can see there's a block for the task queue. So those are the current tasks in the queue. If they're green, they're done. Um, you know, sorry, if they're green, they were successful, they're done, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's. A little overview there. Uh, deployment strategies. <clears throat> so there are different ways to deploy a platform, or that's the, uh, I guess, Eager speak for Drupal code base. Uh, you can use Drush Make. That was, I think, that's been in there for a while. That was sort of the historical way to do that. Um, you can use Git. You know, you just point when you create a platform, you specify a Git URL. Um, when you create it, it just you know does a Git clone. Um, the manual method, you can just stick a directory somewhere and tell Eager, oh, use that as a platform. Uh, Composer's the new stuff that we've got in now, so you can, you can use, um, you know, you can, you can just specify, you can use, so, I don't know, packages, right, is the... Yeah, so there's, yeah. there's a couple of different options with the Composer yeah. <laughs> one. Uh, one is that you're using, you're starting from a, a Git URL, but you don't have any contrib packages built in, right? So the Git model is one where you can, you commit Drupal core and all of your contrib modules into one giant re repository, and then that just clones it, right? The composer method is our preferred method, which is that you don't do any of that, you just maintain a composer.json file. And then uh, when you deploy via this uh, composer uh, deployment strategy, it will 
Git clone your project, which should only have your custom stuff, your exported features, whatever that kind of thing, and then uh, run uh, Composer install to then compile everything else that's required for the, for the full site to operate. Um, the other thing that you can do there is you can initialize a project like that using Composer's uh, create project command. Right? So you can say create project goal gorilla dash open social or slash open social or whatever it is, and then that'll just pull in the project template and initialize the whole thing for you. So this is an example of the form for creating the platform. So as you can see, you need some information. You know, where's the dot created? You know, typically web with Composer nowadays. You know, you put the D URL and then you know what what branch do you want or whatever. So that's and so based on the name, it'll come up with a path that it's going to deploy um, this, the platform to by default, but you can edit that. Um, and then the doc root is like within the project, right? So nowadays, uh, it used to be that the project at the root, you'd have index.php, right? And now everything is moved into web or HTML or doc root. So you just need to specify that stuff. And then there's quite a bit of uh, branch handling, uh, which is something that we use with some contrib stuff to handle environments, for example, right? So we'll have a production branch, staging branch, and whatever, and we can have separate platforms that we can refresh individually to be able to, to track uh, track those environments. And just for more screenshots, we have a bunch of these. So this is to create site forms. So once you have a platform, uh, just to back up a bit, first thing you do is you know create a server, you know tell Eager about your server, then you create a platform which goes onto a server, and then create a site which goes onto a platform. So that's kind of the hierarchy there. So once you have the platform, you can create a site, this is the form, yeah, domain name is, you know, like uh, example.com. That's, you know, what you would point DNS at or whatever. Um, there's a bit of client functionality. Don't want to spend too much time on that. But, you know, you can allow clients to go in here and manage their own sites. That's one possibility. As you can see, you know, you pick your insta installation profile and the platform you want it on, your language, the database server, because you could have several. So you can have some sites using one DB and some using another, that kind of thing. So this is actually the process uh, that's being undertaken in the back end by the Drush commands that we've written, right? So to, to install a site, it's going to create the site directory itself. So remember, we already have a platform. So those by default go under var eager platforms. You could do other stuff, but that's kind of where we do it. So it would be var eager platform slash Drupal 8 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then it'll create the site directory, so slash site slash example.com. Uh, it'll provision a database for you. It'll write the settings.php uh, and drushrc files for you. It stocks a bunch of stuff in drushrc that's then used later on, like a, a list of all the modules that are enabled on the site, so that you can compare when you're doing a platform upgrade and you know that you're not migrating to a platform that doesn't have the same code that you're using on the site. So a lot of sort of back-end stuff that's happening there. It'll write a vhost for you and it'll restart the web server to pick up that vhost, right, or reload it in the case of Nginx in order to, uh, to do that. So it's all the stuff that you normally need to do to, to launch a new site, except in this case, once you hit submit on that form, it does all that for you. So this is, you can see, this is what a site looks like, site <coughs> node looks like once it's created. A lot of metadata, so uh, the metadata is on the left, and there's even, you know, a site report summary, health, security, if your security is up to date, that kind of thing. Uh, in the middle, you've got, all the possible tasks that you can run on the site, like things you can do with it. You know, well, you know, you can only install it once, I guess, that makes sense. Uh, you can verify it, that means rewrite the configuration, like the vhost, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can take a backup, you can delete backups, you can clone it. Uh, so just produce another site that's exactly the same, give it a new name, that kind of thing. Great if you want to quickly clone something, test something to see if it works before doing it on the original, for example. Uh, you can delete, disable, reset password is neat, it'll just do basically if you click on that, uh, you want to you run that task as soon as that completes. Uh, where it says go to, well, there's a little house, like up here, go to the site, that'll turn it into login to site, and then you click on that and you'll get a, you know, the login screen, like, you know, click here to log in, you know, that kind of, the login token. Uh, so, yeah, that's I think pretty much it here. A um, lot of metadata, <laughs> as you can see, whether it's HTTPS or not client authentication, aliases, all that kind of stuff. So bear in mind, when, when I was saying earlier that it's largely written by sysadmins, um, this is what I mean, right? We kind of expose all the data up front. We don't kind of hide it in nicely packaged kind of views, right? So uh, this is something that we're looking at improving with, uh, with future additions, but we certainly find it helpful to just have everything presented to us um, right off the bat. And then most of these are links to allow us to drill into you know, this database server, this platform, whatever might be needed 
uh, to dig into this. I think we're going to see in a, in a little while the, the task uh, log, um, but I just want to point out that uh, for all of the uh, tasks that we can run, you can click the run button to actually execute them, and then the view button is to get a, a listing of the Drush output, right? So Drush is what's running on the back end. We capture that and pipe it back into the front end, and you can actually watch it live, uh, a little like your Travis CI type environment, right, where you can see it, it populating as it goes. And so that's incredibly helpful in terms of understanding what's going on uh, during, these, um, during these tasks. It also tells you the actual command that's being run so that you can yourself go and copy paste it if, say, there's an error somewhere. You can replicate what Eager's doing very simply. And then you can add, you know, dash dash debug and get more detail and be able to dig into it and get it, get it to the point where it's fixed. Uh, or just keep running it here. Uh, so we'll see that, I think, in a minute. Yeah, like typically, if you run a task and it fails, it's, it's red, you'd click on view, oh, what happened? You click on view, you look at the log, and you'd see where, okay, what, what was the output, what failed? Michael, you had a question? For the view button, where's that output display? So there's, there'll be a modal pop-up that, uh, yeah, so that's what ought to... I Sorry, I don't, know if, I don't remember if I have that. I don't think okay. I do. Sorry. All right. Well, uh, anyway. Next time. Just believe me that that happens. Yeah, right. but it's uh, it's incredibly helpful. That's actually some, where I spend most of my time because it, it just works, right? Unless there's a problem with the actual Drupal site, right? So if there's a problem with the Drupal site, that'll be exposed to us through this, and then we can just react to it as need be. Right? Cool. Do you want to talk? Okay. So so uh, the way we do updates. Uh, it's not terribly intuitive right now, although that's going to change soon. Um, if you, yeah, if you want to upgrade a, the code for a site, uh, we do that through what's called a migration process. So what you would do typically is, you know, a, a site would exist on a platform. You would create a new platform um, with, say, you know, the same Git repo, but it's updated code, like newer master or whatever. Um, so you'd, you'd create that. Then you would do a migration of the site from the old platform to the new platform. So that's typically how we'd upgrade stuff. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it, again, from a sysadmin standpoint, it's describing what we're actually doing. It's not describing what we're intending to do, right? So the intention is to run an upgrade, right? Um, but it's describing the actual task that's being done. So um, essentially that's what, what migration does, is move a site from one platform to another. It happens to be the way that we do upgrades because um, the mechanism has uh, provides for all kinds of rollback capabilities, right? So. Essentially, it's going to take a, take a backup and then redeploy the backup, run update.php on this new site that is just created. If there's no failures, then it's going to rewrite the vhost. Right? If there are any failures, your old site remains. It hasn't been torn down at that point. And so you get this blue-green updates uh, capability. And so that's, that's tremendously helpful when you're running an upgrade across like 100 sites or 10 sites or even one site, but particularly helpful when you're running it across many, many sites. Because then you can just kind of leave it, come back to it an hour later, see that 98 of the sites passed, and there's a couple that are red. You can just go in, fix those, and sort of handhold those across the, the final migration, fix whatever little problem there might be with that, and then you're good to go. Right? And so there's not a lot of rework and manual stuff. And the reason that we do it this way, by the way, instead of like just updating the platform underneath the sites, is that if you have a multi-site environment where you've got 100 sites, you need to run update.php on each one of those sites. And so you don't necessarily want to do that all at once because the load would potentially spike on your, on your server. Um, but the other thing is you don't have a rollback mechanism. So if two of those 100 sites fail, how do you get those back into a working state? Right? You'd have to recreate a new platform, somehow deploy a backup to that. Oh, wait, we didn't back up. We're just doing upgrades in place. But that's kind of the, where I was saying the, the best practices that we've put in place really are rigorous. However, doing them manually is incredibly time consuming and just a pain in the ass, right? You have to be very detail oriented to be able to get this stuff done that way. And so we've just automated that. And so an upgrade that would take an hour or two potentially to do manually will take two or three minutes uh, with the system. Yeah. Uh, by this, do you mean like four updates or do you also take this strategy for, say, modules? Oh, yeah. No, Same thing. Core and, my, and modules. Yeah. yeah. So the, the the question was, you do the same for you know, say, adding new modules updates, or just core upgrades. It's all the same. So it's any new code, you create a new platform for it, and then migrate to it, and where you go. Yeah. Like, can I ask you, poll people? Like, how many people here are responsible for security upgrades when, say, Drupal Geddon comes out? Right. <laughs> <coughs> all right. That's good. why you're all here. That's, okay. that's, that's, that, that makes sense. Um, 
On, on average, how many sites are you guys doing? Like, how many people are managing five or more sites? How many people are managing 20 or more sites? How many people are running 100 or more sites? How many people are running 1,000 or more sites? OK, fine. <laughs> All right. Um, a million. No. So for those of you, if, if you don't mind, those of you who are running, say, 100 <laughs> sites, right? How long does it take, if you're not using Eager, are you guys using Eager? The two of you that had 100? No? How long does it take you to upgrade all 100 sites? Uh, we do it overnight. It takes okay. a few days, though. Okay. Well, usually three days to, to, to do an upgrade, and we're running okay. a bunch of sites every night. Okay. So for NDI, I run uh, upgrades for about 250 sites. It takes me roughly three hours. And that's me clicking a button and then walking away for three hours and coming back, right? Like it's, this, this really, the, the use case for this is specifically the cases that you guys are dealing with in that context. Well, and, and I, I think um, like we have our own set of scripts that automate some of this stuff and I think we're really replicating a lot of what you have here. Right. And of course our scripts are very specific to what we're, we're doing, but they haven't had as much, like they haven't got all kinds of rollback stuff. Like there's a lot of more, more things where if it goes wrong, we have gotta mess around and fix it up again. And so I'm hoping that some of this stuff will uh, will help with that. Yeah, yeah. we like what we Definitely. already have, but with a, a lot more rough edges and ironed out, and more features right. and all that kind of sort of thing. Well, right. I mean, uh, Eager's been around now for going on 12 years, and there's like many, many developers have contributed to it over mm -hmm. the over those years to fix all those kinds of edge cases, right? Exactly. Unfortunately, it gets it gets a little bit stricter in terms of how it does things, right? So you can hook into that and alter it, but there's a point at which your alterations are probably going to be compromising the actual reliability of it. So there is a, an eager way of doing things that ensures that. Um, and it's largely a matter of just platform management, right? Doing a, uh, a rigorous job of, of either managing Drush Make files or Composer uh, platforms. Um, and, but once you've got that in place, you're, you're, you're in really good shape, especially if you can maintain a smaller set of platforms because you can individually upgrade each site. Each site has a migrate button, but at the platform level, you also have a migrate button. And all it does is it queues up a, an individual migration for every site on, the set on it. But essentially, that just allows you to hit one button, select the target platform, and you're done. And so from an administrative standpoint, it's really, really efficient. And that's, that's what we've been optimizing for. Obviously not UI, right? That's that's not our forte. So we're coming we're coming to that in the next versions. But that's we're, we're a lot of us are, we're pretty back end. So if any front end people want to help with uh, what it looks like, please step forward. Um, so I, I think one question you didn't ask uh, Christopher was, is anyone using Eager now? No, it's a few people. Two, okay. Yeah. No. Cool. Good. Great. Uh, Okay, so this is the migration form. So as you can see, there's not that much to it, right? It's, do you want to change the name? Actually, <laughs> speaking of usability, yeah. this is how we rename sites. So say you've got, you know, a.example.com and you want to rename it to b.example.com. Uh, you also use the migration form. So what we do is you would hit, hit the migrate button, you'd get this form and you would just change the name here and then hit migrate and it would just rename it. So that's Another usability thing, you know, when you first get to Eager, you think, oh, where's the rename button? But it's, you have to do a run up, do a migrate, right? So that's something to, uh, to improve. And uh, there's a sorry. particular, sorry, just there's a particular reason for doing it that way as well, because we're not just changing the vhost. We're actually going through the database and anywhere within uh, a field where the URL of the site exists, we're rewriting it there too. So if you have a link to an image, for example, that's a canonical link, like full link, we're going to rewrite that within the body text of a node, for example. And so that's why we go through this migrate process, because we want to have a backup of what it was before, so that if something went wrong, you can just restore that backup, right? But that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. Uh, I've actually never had that back. fail, which is nice. So yeah. yeah, it doesn't fail, but I mean, yeah. it's the kind of thing that's, it's, it's always good to have that backstop, right? In yeah. case there's an issue. And so, yeah, so typically, you know, if you do want to upgrade it, so there's new code, um, it'll show you the current platform that's selected where it's on now. You would select another one. In this case, there are only two platforms. You know, you might have 20 of these. Uh, you select the one you want, hit migrate, and away you go. As you can see, there's extra stuff at the bottom. It'll tell you how many, say, upgrades to modules there are. Uh, here, there's none. Uh, there are no errors. There's some warnings. You can hit compare, and it'll show you a side-by-side -side of, you know, here are the module versions on the old site. Here are the module versions on the new site. Are you sure you want to do that? You know, so you can review that and then hit go or not, depending on what you want to do. So. Yeah, in this case, all those warnings are because that's an older platform, right? So you would actually be downgrading stuff, right? And that's, that's not a good thing to do, hence yeah. why it's going to flag it as a warning. So um, 
as I said, the, the sort of core use case generally is one server running a web server and a database and people just running as many sites as they want on that. Um, there's a lot of flexibility to, um, to distribute that and to have uh, high performance and high availability sites. High availability in particular is one of the things that uh, I've done a lot of work with. So we have this um, two methods of doing clustering essentially of the front end components. So this is mostly the web servers being structured in different ways. Uh, the web cluster model module basically allows you to have multiple web front ends um, and it'll r-sync the platforms out to, to each of them to keep those in sync. The challenge there is that um, you don't have a shared file system across them by default and so you need to have something like S3 um, to, uh, and on the sites that are going to be running configured with S3 to have that remote data store for the, for the files. Um, the alternative is Webpack which is a little bit uh, simpler to set up in that it mounts the entire platform on NFS and just mounts, or sorry, it, put, it makes that available via NFS and then mounts it on each of the web servers. And so by that virtue, you have your site's uh, files folder is also mounted on all of the servers. Um, in the high availability mode, generally you're going to want to use the web cluster because you might be able, like one of the things that I've been able to do, for example, is have it run across two data centers and uh, load balance across those data centers, have varnish load balancing across the web nodes, um, and crossing over between data centers at that point. But we were able to get it to the point where an entire data center going offline resulted in one white screen, and then everything just started going to the, to the other site, uh, the other servers that were up and running. When we brought the, server, the, the data center back up, uh, everything started to flow within 30 seconds uh, to be load balanced back across uh, without um, any issues with regards to uh, file uh, availability, <coughs> performance, or so forth. So, um, good stuff, advanced usage, just bear that in mind. Um, I just wanted to add, that I think I found that it's important to point out that because Agar is a simple web stack, you can wrap anything around it. So like, if you are into Amazon and all their ELDs and all the things they do, you can simply wrap that around your server and know that, that like the Agar single core is where your files are going to live as the primary. Um, same thing with like all these cloud providers now provide like ways to do that. Yeah. And so it's important to remember that this isn't like some Docker locked in thing. This is just a LAMP stack. And so it works within other systems, right? So yeah, that the scalability is a lot of options. Absolutely. That high availability system happened to be on AWS, but I've built similar things on yeah. Linode. And uh, I don't know, now we're working with Cloud A, which is an OpenStack provider. And so it's, it's really quite flexible. Um, and it, it kind of just doesn't really have to care too much, right? As long as the LAMP stack's installed and there's a user with the proper permissions, it can use those resources. And I think uh, on the site form you saw a, a little bit earlier that, you know, we have site auditing, monitoring, reporting. So it'll tell you, you know, do you, you'll see, you know, big red X if security updates need to be done, give you some other warnings, say, yeah, I mean, you're, you're like running out of file system space, that kind of stuff. So, it's, so, so that's really useful too. <coughs> and also warn you of things like the devel module is turned on on a production site. Right? Like right. Just useful things to know about sites and mm -hmm. keeping the health and security of those sites up to date. All right, so uh, how do you do workflows across environments, development, staging, prod, that kind of stuff? So um, the tool that's crucial, for me at least, uh, is we have this module called remote, uh, remote site import, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the way that works is um, say you've got three Agar installations, you've got dev, staging, and prod, and you want to, you know, you, you want to update the staging environment or the staging site, you can delete that, actually you don't even have to do this anymore. You can remotely import, you can, you can say pull in a site from production onto staging where I am now, and it can overwrite that site with the new, so it's kind of like the, you know, the drag and drop environment stuff that, you know, Pantheon and Aqua have. So you can do that here the same kind of way. Though the JS isn't as nice, but <laughs> so yeah, same idea. So, so if you're, because um, you know, Agar knows about all its possible servers, right? So on dev, you know, okay, there's also staging and prod. So you, you know, select the other one that you want to import from, um, pick the site, uh, decide the platform you want to throw it on locally, and you hit go, and it'll just slurp in that site. So that's how you would move sites between environments. Really, really useful stuff. Um, dev shop, I don't know if John, you want to talk about that for ten seconds. <laughs> um, it's got a nice, you know, front end for all that kind of thing. The uh, moving sites to environments and keeps track of environments more. 
We also uh, does a bunch of integration with like CI systems. And yeah, it's just it's a layer on top of Vagor so that it simplifies the whole like atomic platform workflow. So that instead it's more of a git push, git pull workflow. So um, it can be much more rapid in terms of development and like it'll receive a pull request and clone the entire platform plus site over. And we've got buttons to copy database quickly between them. So it's just you know it's more useful for like one-off development sites as opposed to a thousand platform uh, sites on a platform, um, but it's very much better for developers because they can very quickly make changes and just do get push. And yeah, that's a good thing. But actually, there are different use cases for this, right? Like some folks that run or run around this stuff might be interested, you know, development environments and quickly doing a lot of get pulls and stuff like that. And then you know the other side is like, you know, you know, do you want production systems that you want to be immutable? You don't want anyone to do run get pulls on them. That kind of stuff. You have to be more careful. You you know, make sure using the rollback process, my migrations. You wouldn't you wouldn't be updating. You know, doing git pulls on your production platform. That kind of stuff. So they're different. You know, different things you can do with it for different use cases, right? Yeah, so. and it's because it's so it's so simple just to install or create a server very quickly. Like often, I'll use DevShop just for the development pipeline for a client, and even if they're posted on their own like nginx system by their server team, you know, so like the development team will hack away, hack away on branches, and eventually when they'll build a release, build an artifact, send that to the server team, and they'll deploy it however they want, whether it's, you know, some, any, it could, you know, so it's nice to separate. Sometimes I'll, you can even have, like, an Angular production server to do that, to the migration type release, but use DevShop to, like, build the actual code base until it's ready. And yep, yep. Uh, there's another, so while there's DevShop, there's also another, um, I guess, distro, Agar, or uh, system that does things in addition to that. Um, there's Boa or Octopus, which is, so if anyone's sort of a mega8.cc, uh, it's a Drupal hosting company. It's it's really, um, it's really hosted Agar. Like you get your own Agar and you can, you know, provision your own sites, that kind of stuff. Um, they, it's all open source. So you can just take all that and run it yourself. Kind of thing, so that's that's kind of cool. Uh, that's another another use case. They did they did a lot of development work on Agar itself, so that's good. Uh, a lot of people using it for different use cases, so yay. Um, you can also uh, just quickly mention the Agar API, um, and you can so just like you've got hooks into Drupal where you can alter it, we have hooks into Agar where you can alter it. So say you can do things like um, just before a, a site gets upgraded or deleted or something, you can hook into that and say, okay, do something now, or do something after, or do something at this time, right? So any step in the process, you can hook in and alter what's going on. So it's really, really flexible that way, and that's how all these other projects are hooking into it. Uh, we've got a web services component. So there's Agar services, uh, which will expose all this stuff. So say you've got you know another front-end site or you know uh, mobile apps or whatever that can you could control it with your phone or something, that kind of thing. So we do expose all this with the RESTful API. Uh, we've got a extension of that called Agar SaaS, uh, which is sort of for, I guess, site factory setups where you know you want to be able to have clients, your clients say, go to a site, um, decide they want to, you know, spin up a bunch of sites, they'll pay whatever. Um, then that you know that could send a web service call to the Agar backend. To the hosting service and it'll spin those up. It'll do whatever you know commands. It's just yeah, remote control basically, and it can run some non-Drupal things. Yeah, so the but, CRM support is really excellent. It's actually native and used by the Civic CRM project for their own hosting of their their uh, their own Civic CRM um, deployments. Uh, there is also WordPress support, but it's it's kind of wonky. So the way that Eager was architected kind of assumed Drupal all the way in, so it's kind of baked in. And the way that we uh, host WordPress is essentially by tricking Eager into thinking WordPress is a Drupal site. So we have a Drush wrapper around WPC, WPCLI, which is the WordPress equivalent to Drush, and then uh, a bunch of provision commands that kind of wrap around that to, uh, to be able to deploy WordPress code bases, uh, install sites on them, things of that nature. So we can do it, it's not kind of that native functionality, um, and so there's a, there's a subset of functionality that works well with it. Um, that is something that we are working on for the next version to kind of take, remove Drupal as a priority. It's going to be a type of application that will be able to support. It'll still be a priority because it's where the communities, you know, of users is from, but 
Uh, we want to be able to abstract it enough to, you know, if we're writing a vhost and, and provisioning a database, there's lots of things that need a vhost and a database to run, right, and to collect a code base uh, to run it on top of. So there's a lot of abstraction that we can do on that basis that uh, we're going to be seeing in, in future versions. Uh, I can talk quickly about the HTTPS support. So we've now got fully automatic um, HTTPS going through Let's Encrypt. So they have free certificates uh, for that purpose. And so we hooked into that. And you can basically just say, yeah, when you, when you create a site, I remember I showed you the create site form a while ago. I don't think it was on that form. It was too far down. But there's an option, you know, encryption, no, um, yes, or Forced? Where's it like uh, required? It's like it's enabled. Optional. Yeah, none enabled or required are the options. So if you put on enabled, it'll allow both HTTP and HTTPS. If you put required, it'll redirect all HTTP requests to HTTPS. And as we mentioned earlier, there are different queues in Anchor that do things like run backups and and go through things in the task queue. There's also a queue for the, this stuff. So every because those certificates don't last very long. I think it's 90 days. So it'll everyone's thought it'll check. Okay, you know what's is this going to expire soon? If yes, then get me a new certificate, that kind of thing. So that's fully automated. Uh, it's really nice. Everybody's using it now, so, so that's pretty cool. And there are tons of other contrib modules also. Just like, you know, we have contribs for Drupal, we have contribs for Eager, uh, which are also on Drupal.org generally. So, yeah, you, again, you can write your own. There are all kinds of other ways of doing things. You know, if you have cloud services you want to use, you can hook into it. There's, like, you know, S3 plugins and all that kind of stuff, right? So... I think I mentioned this, but uh, it's just like Drupal Core in that there's an Agar API that you can hook in anywhere and do things. I mentioned that already. Custom workflows, you can tie it into your CI, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, you can inject, say you, know, say you want custom stuff in your vhost config, you can throw that in there with hooks. Uh, run code after site creation, etc., etc. So Agar 3 is the, the currently stable product that everyone's out there, it's using, it works, it's great. Uh, we've got, looking down the horizon, down the road, Agar 4, something that John's working on, which will basically replace Drush with Symfony. Uh, it keeps the original front end of Agar 3. Um, it's, do you want to, I don't know, John, do you want to spend a few seconds? Nah, it's good. Okay, cool. So yeah, so that's, that's one thing John's working on. Um, that's a that's, uh, good solution for now, as it might not be able to support Drush forever, so just a bit of background on that, Drush 9. Um, so we sort of rely on Drush being global, like on the VM or server or whatever, uh, and that kind of was how everything was done. Um, with Drush 9, now there's no such thing as global Drush anymore. It's a per site thing that's baked in with Composer. Um, so there's some issues around that. So yeah, we can't, we can't stick with using Drush forever. Um, <laughs> so hence the movement here. Um, Agar 5, though, is we thought, you know, let's, we have a good opportunity to rewrite everything and not be so Drupal specific. So do you want to talk about that? That's Christopher here is uh, spearheading that initiative. So Yeah, so uh, bear in mind that Eager was originally written in Drupal 5 uh, on PHP 4, and there's still relics of that in the code base. Um, so <clears throat> um, back then, also, even things like CCK, never mind fields and core, was not a thing. So most of our fields are custom, custom code that uh, will, and we manage our own database tables and all kinds of things of that nature. So um, in, with Eager 5, what we're doing is starting from scratch in Drupal 8, um, the uh, front end is intended to be largely a two things, right? So one is a, a, a default front end, and then all of the entities and business logic to allow it to run as a, as a headless Drupal as well, right? So, um, essentially what we're doing is keeping largely the same architecture. So there's going to be entities on the front end that represent sites and platforms and tasks and things of that nature. Um, we have replaced the queue that we have now, which is largely just a database table keeping track of the tasks that we're adding with a full-blown task queue called Celery. It's a Python application that uses RabbitMQ and things on the back end so it can be fully distributed. Um, and instead of us custom writing things in Drush, bear in mind, when we started 12 years ago, things like Ansible didn't exist, Puppet was just starting, uh, we weren't aware of it at the time, it certainly wasn't robust enough for us to use, um, and so we wrote how to deploy Drupal sites, right, in, and we do things like template out a vhost and, and create a, a database table and all the things that we were talking about. We do those things natively in PHP. 
PHP isn't particularly well suited to doing that kind of stuff. Um, now there are tools like Ansible that do that kind of thing much, much better than we could ever hope to because they do them in a lot of different contexts and have whole communities around doing sysadmin type things. And so we're looking at leveraging that. So now instead of having Drush on the back end, we use Drush, but we use Drush the way it's intended to be used. So that site local install is fine because we can then run Drush site install and have it do its thing instead of us trying to sort of strong arm it into doing it the way that we want to do it. Um, but the architecture is largely the same. The default UI that's going to come out of it is going to be comparable so that it's kind of a, a, a smooth transition for those users who are already using it. Um, but then we also have a lot more flexibility and, and, and new resources available to us, new methods of doing things uh, that will um, make it a lot um, more flexible to start re-architecting. So we're going to keep those solid workflows that we talked about, you know, taking a backup and restoring the backup or deploying from the backup and then only rewriting the vhost once update.php is run, you know, that stuff where we have a, all that rollback capability. We're going to keep that for now because we know that stuff works. What we want to do is then provide ourselves with a bunch of new resources and tools that we can then start to innovate more, uh, more nimbly on that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's something that uh, is currently in sort of pre-alpha. Um, I hope to get an alpha out soon. I just haven't had any time to work on it. Um, I can deploy Drupal sites and install, uh, or platforms and install sites on it already, right? Like, I mean, that's the easy part. The hard part is getting all of the really rigorous stuff in. And so that's kind of what we're working on now. Um, but the plan is for it to be able to host anything, right? Like I said, you know, if you're provisioning a database, that's something you do for a lot of different things. And if you have Ansible on the back end and you're basically just passing variables into it and the roles or tasks that it should be operating on, um, then a lot of other options become available. And among them is sort of what John was alluding to as well, is the ability to spin up a new server on AWS, right, for example. Like if you want a new EC2 instance, Ansible has resources to be able to do that. And so you could put a front end in place that would allow you to spin up a server, configure it the way you want, deploy a platform to it, install a site on it. Right? So from scratch, get a whole new system up and running. Um, and you could be able to do that from like a local host install, right? You could install it on your laptop and then deploy a whole cluster, um, basically just from a local install. So that's kind of the, the vision for what we're looking and, at. And uh, for those of you that like recursion, you could even use Agar to provision Agar, right? So, yeah. Which can, on its own, provision Agar. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ad infinitum, right? So, so the other thing uh, about that is, you know, now we started with Ansible, but that the back end, so the heavy lifting tool, that's, that's, in that's pluggable. So we're hoping at some point to um, use Kubernetes maybe instead of Ansible, right? So that's an option, right? Because we, Kubernetes can do a lot of cool things. So, you know, we, we're, we're hoping to do that as well. Um, I just want to point out, we may be moving now to get that in the current stable. Oh, figure. great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, the, the Helm uh, system is, I, I'm good friends with Scott Rigby uh, from New York. He's a maintainer of the Drupal chart for Helm which is the easiest, apparently I hear, I still haven't launched it myself, but the easiest way to like launch Drupal or other things is just it's this Helm command line thing. Um, and I have a client who, someone is literally working on figuring out Helm, Drupal, Kubernetes right now, and I connected them, and they're very excited. So this may be happening quickly. Yeah, that's largely what we're, we're yeah. intending to do. The Kubernetes backend is also something that, like deploying Kubernetes can be a bit of a pain. Yeah. So part of what we're trying to be able to do here is um, have Ansible provision the infrastructure and deploy Kubernetes and then be able to start deploying Drupal on top of Kubernetes, right? Like it's, we want to be able to do the whole, all those, all the layers for it. The point is there are a lot of things you can do with this, right? So. Right. <laughs> but I think I got this guy very excited about actually not just doing it, but contributing. Oh, that's great. And making, and working with me to get this thing so they can just like click and be in good production. Beautiful, yeah. that's good. So yeah, so we have an architecture doc. That's actually a link. You can't tell from this, but there should be, there's links throughout this. When you get a copy of this later, I'll post it. Um, you should be able to follow links to, you know, we have documentation site, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's pretty much it. So yeah, I wanted to leave time for discussion, questions, that kind of stuff. So anyone have any thoughts, questions? Or, yeah. Yeah, so um, I tried Twinkle uh, a few years ago. But um, it, it seems to be just work for like um, if you have the multi site, right? Only work for the subdomain structure. So it doesn't work for like. 
so us, we need like slash something? Yes. We have that now. Something you have to, you yeah. have that now. It didn't work a while ago, but it does now, yeah. Okay, yeah. It was a contrib module, and it was kind of like a little wonky, but now That's it's part of core, so yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, you have to turn on an extra module so that okay. it'll, it'll recognize that you can put slashes into a URL, which by default, it's assuming it's a domain name and not a URL, right? So okay, that's where, nice. but it'll now parse that out and understand that and create the right uh, file structure. Yes, the module's called Subdir? I think it's called Subdir, yes. Yeah. Hosting, hosting Subdir. Okay. So in, <coughs> in Ego, there's a features so page. I can, I can reprogram this to my, by my own, right? It's not like hosting service. Yeah, so if you have a VM of your own, you can, um, in the installation documents, uh, basically the, the, the easiest thing is to use uh, Ubuntu or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you add our repository, we maintain uh, Debian packages. And yeah, just install it, sudo apt install eager3. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, you have a VM, go, yeah, go nuts. The basic install instructions are on that, on the main home dish, right? The, yeah. The, just a quick, you know. Yeah, there's like four or five lines, kind of, to, to, yeah. to get it done. And then yeah, just go to agarproject.org. It'll point you to all the right places. Exactly. Yeah. Any, any further questions? Questions, questions? concerns? Yeah. yeah. Is PHP 7 compatible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're running on PHP 7 now. I think we're debugging a couple of 7.2 issues. I think I just fixed the last 7.2 issue that I found, so, yeah. But I think those are pretty minor, right? They were just notices. Oh, yeah. It was, it was just notices that, you know, new warnings or whatever. But, yeah, no, it's, yeah, we're, we're on top of that. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, is the is the yeah. app working for sixteen or eighteen runner? Uh, uh, it should be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what I was. How we deployed it. Working on. Yeah. The only thing left as of a week ago was a couple notices, uh, but I just I think I just committed that. So or, or Herman did. <laughs> Someone. Who can we recruit to maintain an RPM? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long-standing thing that we've been trying to. A lot of people have stepped up and said, you know, we we yeah. run um, we run Red Hat and we'd love to maintain a uh, an RPM for you, and nobody has. Yeah. So, by maybe, all means, if anybody does want to, maybe we put something on the blog. Like, let's let's try to. Yeah, you know, contributors <laughs> help, welcome, patches yeah, yeah, welcome, all that kind of stuff, fun. right? So, I mean, that's that's why we yeah, have the manual. I'll, I'll raise I'll raise the possibility because I do have clients on Red Hat, and I just got to tell them like, look. I'm just going to focus on making this because you want it to, don't you? <laughs> like, we, we just FYI, like, I, yeah, that's why DevShop hasn't installed that SH script instead of the Debian because it works on Red Hat as well. Right. So it, it's still just basically installing a bunch of packages and stuff, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, and if anyone, if anyone is looking to do this kind of thing, doesn't know how, needs help, we do consulting, support, setups for this kind of stuff, that's what we do, so feel free to come and talk with us if you want, so. On, on the Red Hat side and stuff, like one of the reasons we maintain the manual install docs is to make it so that people can access, you know, they understand what needs to be done as a put app to get install kind of hides all of that from you, right? Um, but I also have a number of um, Ansible roles that will deploy Eager in a manual mon model for you. So those that actually supports, if I recall correctly, it supports Red Hat uh, reasonably well. Um, but I'm, I might be wrong about that. I, it's been a while since I've tested it. Yeah, well, DevShop is all Ansible roles. And yeah. we actually, it's 90% yearling guy. So yeah, his, exactly. his roles are great for, yeah. he mostly handles both, both families. Right. Um, and if people don't know, it's the same exact configs as like Drupal VM. So it's right. a lot, uh, a, lot even, a lot more collaboration than you might even think. Right. And um, I mean, we have actually run this on Mac OS X, on Solaris. We've had like really weird use cases over the years. <laughs> and I mean, Solaris is something that I, I was really surprised to see, but but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a LAMP stack manager, right? So if you can run Apache on it, you can run Eager on it. Or Nginx. Or Nginx. Well, I don't know if they were running Nginx on, on Solaris. That's that probably was, true, yeah. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. All right. Yeah. Thanks again.